which is a different thing. Uh, and I'll try to make clear what's different about CFT ADS uh, 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 compared to ADS CFT. In ADS CFT, uh, what uh, we, we have, we have a, a, a bock, uh, which is uh, an ADS geometry, uh, and, um, and we have a boundary, uh, and we tend to think about the CFT as living on the boundary, uh, and in the bock, we have a, a theory of gravity, we have maybe a string theory, but we go to a large end limit and the boundary theory is, is strongly coupled so that the bulk theory is weakly coupled. Uh, and then uh, you can write many, many papers with amazing results because you can just do uh, classical gravity in the bulk and uh, declare that you've done some strongly coupled physics on the boundary. Uh, and the bulk of the ADS-CFT literature is of that type. So, uh, strongly coupled CFTs are interesting, but they're not the most interesting uh, topic to study. And indeed, you can do many more things than looking at strongly coupled CFTs. You can deform them looking at RG flows. Uh, I'm a big fan of this, this duality. But there's another aspect to ADS-CFT, uh, which is that the bulk itself uh, is our best, at least the, the duality, is our best description that we have of quantum gravity. Uh, and quantum gravity is something that we don't really understand. Uh, it's the theory, it should be the theory of space-time, it should be the quantum theory of space-time, but what is it? Now, in recent years, uh, there have been many interesting questions, additional questions that have been asked about these kind of things. Uh, again, if we have a quantum state uh, and it has a certain extent, you can ask about the quantum correlations between one, or the entanglement between one region and the other regions. Uh, and quantum entanglement is one way of trying to figure out what the structure of a state is. And again, you can do those computations in field theory, all very interesting, but I think uh, ADS-CFT is such a powerful idea that it really allows us to start asking questions about the state psi that lives here in the bulk. Suppose you live in the bulk of ADS, you want to do quantum mechanics and start to do, try to ask what are, the, what are the things that we know about uh, a quantum state in a theory that actually has quantum gravity in the bulk. So this is where CFT ADS lives, in the bulk. But the reason for why CFT ADS uh, is, is the opposite than ADS CFT is I'm not going to allow you to do do is to think about the quantum mechanics of the CFT, and then I'm going to ask you, what can you say about what happens here? That's, that's a, a, an interesting question that you can ask. Uh, it's a hard question because the CFT is supposed to be strongly coupled, uh, but we know that the answer should be simple, so there must be classical structures within, uh, uh, within a strongly coupled CFT, and the question is, can you use the CFT language to bring that uh, about. And uh, again, the amaz amazing thing of ADS-CFT is that, although I'm putting this arrow here in the bulk of the ADS, so by the way, this up here is time, so this is a certain time slice, and I'm interested in the state that lives here. Uh, but the claim is that the state that lives there, which is the ADS state, is actually the same as the CFT state. Uh, which, of course, is, is, is strange because this is a, 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 a theory of one more dimension uh, than that, and how can you um, uh, map those things to each other? Uh, but indeed, uh, so the question is, how is this possible? Why uh, is this the right thing to do? Uh, and those are the uh, questions you should uh, ask yourself. And uh, according to the ADS-CFT dictionary, uh, we haven't been able to, at least so far, we haven't been able to make too much progress with it because the ADS-CFT dictionary, most of the prescriptions that we've been using is to say, hey, uh, take a correlation function of the CFT and it corresponds with doing some kind of bulk, um, uh, the path integral over the bulk, or you have a classical solution in the bulk with certain boundary conditions, and the bulk is always treated as a black box, and to some, at least not quite as a black box, but, but it's hard to probe things in the middle 
of ADS because we are instructed to always go to the boundary from the point of view of the CFT. Now, um, so the, uh, it seems that the duality clearly works, so ADS CFT is, is, is seems a, a correct duality, but the very basic things that we don't know about the bulk, and we're, we're essentially confused about this dictionary. Um, and for example, one question that we don't know really uh, is, uh, say, what is the classical bulk geometry Uh, what does it really mean from the point of view of the CFT? Is it something in the CFT or the classical bulk metric? Um, and uh, and it could be there has to be gravity. Uh, where is gravity really coming from? Uh, and there are other things that we have. Uh, we have black holes. Um, and indeed, in the last few years, there has been quite a bit of debate. Um, whether or not in ADS CFT, um, since again there's uh, gravity, we could put uh, a, a black hole in the bulk uh, by heating up the CFT at finite temperature. The CFT describes a black hole with, in the bulk. Um, but uh, the thing that apparently uh, we haven't been able to figure out uh, is whether or not that black hole has an interior or not. So that's the question. Where, where is the black hole interior in ADS CFT? And why is it such a hard question? Uh, is because the CFT observables all seem to live on the boundary. Uh, they don't penetrate the bulk. Uh, they only by, penetrate the bulk by means of propagation. And since the boundary sits outside of the black hole, if the black hole sits somewhere in the middle, then any observable that you would have on the boundary is only able to look outside of the horizon of the black hole by definition, and the interior of the black hole seems to be completely uh, hidden from view, and therefore it's not clear if the CFT even describes it or allows for its existence. So that's basically what this, the, the firewall uh, paradox has been about. The AMPS paper basically made clear that from the point of view of quantum mechanics, we, did, we, were not, we, we don't understand what a black hole geometry really is uh, uh, in, in the bulk. So, um, so that, these are questions that we don't have any, seem to have any answers to, but um, that we have hints. Uh, and let me just mention a few hints, although they will not say too much about those particular ideas. The idea of the last several years, 10 years, that I find actually one of the most um, stimulating ideas in this whole thing, uh, in, in, in ADS CFT for sure, is the Ryu Taganagi uh, proposal uh, that if you look at entanglement entropy uh, from the point of view of the CFT, that you can quantify that entanglement entropy between region A and region B by taking the boundary of region A on the, on the boundary of ADS and looking at the minimal surface area uh, of the minimal surface in the bulk. So there's this uh, Beckinson Hawking type formula where now in this case the root Oginagi formula tells you that the entanglement entropy on the boundary theory is given by this minimal surface area. And the fact that the any area of the, min, of the minimal surface for a given boundary curve actually extends into the bulk uh, gives you an indication, uh, gives you a handle at least of, of some aspects in the bulk. Um, this I find a very intriguing, um, uh, at least a very beautiful result. Other hints that we have about this, so this is an important hint about the bulk geometry. Uh, uh, but the other hints we have, of course, is that the boundary theory has a stress energy tensor. So the, phys the physics of the stress energy tensor of the boundary correlation functions are related to uh, correlation functions of gravitons in the bulk or scattering of gravitons in the bulk. So that's a hint that we have. Other things that we have is thermodynamics. The fact uh, that uh, thermodynamical laws and the fact that we have an entropies gives us a way of extracting gravitational physics from uh, boundary considerations. Uh, and these are very interesting directions that are happening, uh, developments that are happening uh, at, at this moment. But I want to um, sort of go to a, a different um, approach to asking 
or at least to clarifying some of these questions. So these questions are deep questions uh, and, and they are uh, kind of universal in the sense that uh, gravity is clearly the universal property of the Bock. Uh, the Bock could be have any dimension, so any dimension bigger than three in the Bock, you have black holes in the Bock. Uh, and um, of course the reason for why we are confused about um, uh, properties of the interior of the black holes uh, is precisely related to uh, the old uh, information paradox of black holes where um, um, uh, when black holes were first uh, yeah, studied in a quantum mechanical context by Hawking, he showed that if the black hole actually has a smooth horizon, then it must radiate. Uh, the radiation looks thermal. The final state of a black hole after it evaporates appears to be a thermal state. It needs to be a thermal state for the horizon to be smooth. And then there was the information paradox. How can you extract information that was, went into the black hole from the final state? But Hawking put in there that the horizon was smooth. In ADS CFT, we actually know that quantum mechanics holds. The boundary is uh, a theory. The CFT is a quantum mechanical theory. Uh, and therefore, if that theory contains a black hole, it should have unitary time evolution. Uh, and then essentially, uh, what the firewall paradox is, is that we don't understand really in a unitary theory how you can actually have a black hole that emits radiation without destroying the smoothness of the horizon. So that's the question. And people were obviously uh, quite confused about it uh, because we've had five or six workshops with no consensus about this issue. Um, but uh, let me uh, just bring in the following uh, element that this same, uh, first of all, this, this debate is really conceptual uh, about interior and exterior of black holes, uh, and it's independent of dimensions. So I could go to a lower dimensional example, which I'm going to be doing, so my lecture today will be uh, about ADS3, CFT2, but ADS3 has a black hole, which is known as the BTC black hole, and all the conceptual questions that I'm listing here uh, are uh, true in this particular um, setting. So ADS3 CFT2 has all those questions in it. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is that in ADS3 CFT2, all these questions have a very explicit answers. So in CFT2, in, in a two-dimensional CFT, contains all the information that you need to construct the bulk geometry. You can construct the bulk metric. You can explain exactly how particles interact with gravity. You can find the black hole interior, purely in the CFT language. Um, and so all those questions have answers in this particular, you can call it a toy setting, but the conceptual uh, 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 puzzles are still there uh, and there should be useful lessons. Now, uh, when I um, uh, was asked to give uh, references uh, for you to read, um, I couldn't resist uh, putting a classic paper on there, which is the BPZ, Belyavin Polyakov Zomolochikov paper about two dimensional uh, conformal field theory. Uh, I want to ask who has studied that paper before this lecture? Who did not study it? Be honest. Okay, of those who raise their hand right now, how many of you are doing research connected with ADS CFT? Raise your hand. Okay, this evening, don't go to sleep before you study the paper. <laughs> okay, you should not think you know anything correctly about CFT if you have not studied that paper carefully. It's really the paper that sets the stage. Okay, so uh, th th by the way, I've succeeded in giving my lecture. This was the only point I wanted to make. Uh, is <laughs> that's a paper you want to you read. Uh, the other thing indeed is, uh, is re read the AMPS paper because uh, what's great about that paper is that it asks questions and makes you feel uncomfortable about what you thought you know. And that's another thing that you want to remember. Okay, um, so ADS3, so let me, so. I'd like to play with the rules that I'm giving myself here that I can only use the CFT in order to learn things about the book. 
but uh, let me at least tell you a little bit something about ADS-3 um, so that you know where this is headed. So ADS-3 is basically the SL2R group manifold. So I can parameterize ADS-3 by a group element in SL2R. Um, ADS-3 has isometries. It's basically the, the Poincaré group of ADS-3. Uh, the isometries of SL2R is SL2R times SL2R because I can act on the left with an SL2R element or I can act on the right with an SL2R element. So SL2R times SL2R is the isometry group of uh, ADS-3. Now, uh, I'm not interested just purely in ADS-3. I want to throw stuff into ADS-3. I really want to have particles here. I want to have a, whatever, a solar system inside of, uh, of ADS-3. Um, so, indeed, uh, there's going to be uh, objects that have mass uh, and, and that will deform the geometry. Uh, but one of the great things about uh, gravity in two plus one dimensions, which is obviously why I'll be able to do much more there, than in other uh, situations, is that there's no graviton in two plus one dimensions, so I don't need to worry about <coughs> propagating uh, gravitons. But still, I have objects and they can back react. But the way they back react is as follows, is that outside of any uh, region where there's matter, uh, the curvature of space is still negative. It has the same curvature as the ADS curvature. So locally, for every configuration of matter, uh, the space still looks like ADS, outside of the matter. So, for example, if I have uh, some object here, it could be a black hole or it could be a particle, um, then if I'm outside of that region where there's stress energy, um, everything looks uh, locally like an SL2R manifold. It lo locally looks like SL2R, uh, uh, like ADS-3. But if I go around and I come back, then uh, I no longer return to the same value of my group. So I, uh, the coordinate here is G. I go around and I ask, do I come back to the same group element? And if there's matter here, you don't. So basically, that's a curvature singularity where the metric is not just purely uh, negative uh, constant. Uh, and indeed, you have what we would call holonomies, and you can label those holonomies by an H left and an H R. Uh, where that h left and h right are determined in terms of the mass and the angular momentum of the object that sits here, okay? So this is essentially all you need to know about two plus one dimensional gravity. And if indeed you would be lo living in ADS-3, this is how you would describe the gravitational interactions classically, okay? Um, now, uh, so there's a dictionary, um, which I'm, uh, I'll write down in a second, between the mass and the spin uh, and the h left and h right. By the way, at what time did I exactly start? Uh, at uh, 3.20, so I have till 4.20. Good. Um, so, um, so let me briefly write down. So if you have um, an object with uh, mass m and spin j, uh, then uh, h left, uh, right can be written as follows. This is, by the way, for if the, if the uh, mass of the object is big, uh, L uh, is the, uh, the ADS radius, um, R plus and minus are actually location of the black hole horizon, outer horizon and the inner horizon, but for now they're just parameters related to uh, the mass and the spin. Here I'm introducing a delta left and a delta right, which I'll uh, use later, uh, which is a combination of the mass and the spin like this. Uh, and uh, these quantities are plus and are minus. Uh, this is minus here. Uh, should I put a square around it? Yes, it's divided by 16L. Okay, so, uh, so that's the dictionary, is that, okay, if I have a heavy object in, uh, sitting there somewhere, then if I go around it, I come back not to the same as to our group element, but I have to multiply it times some diagonal matrix. By the way, this thing here 
if it's a black, if this thing is a black hole, this thing is what you call uh, an element of an hyperbolic Koenigsegg class of SL2R. SL2R looks like the Lorentz group in two plus one dimensions. Hyperbolic elements are like boosts. Uh, and there's a similar story that you could tell if you have a small particle, say, with mass m and spin s, you could still go around that particle. It still back reacts, uh, and it has a little conical deficit. Uh, in that case, the h left and h right are elements of, of an elliptic Koenigsegg class. So there's a, a small deficit angle, which is a rotation uh, within SO2-1. Okay. Um, if I would take uh, a, po a point particle or a, a black hole and I would take a spatial section and I would look at this thing, um, what the spatial metric looks like near a point particle, the point particle is, has stress energy and it creates a cusp. Let me draw it like this. If the point particle sits here and two-dimensional space, uh, I'm drawing its shape. Uh, like that. So the two-dimensional space, the spatial section of the ADS-3 would have a cusp at the location of a point particle, okay? This thing is a black hole uh, because if I would want to draw the two-dimensional spatial section in the neighborhood of a black hole, uh, I'll find that the geometry actually looks like that. Uh, where this, say, is the interior of the black hole this thing here would be the horizon of the black hole. So this is sort of where the black hole sits. And this is like outside of the black hole. Uh, I flipped the picture here. So, so the, the, instead of a, uh, a point uh, defect, this black hole really has a, a finite uh, size. Uh, and if I go around it, uh, I pick up that uh, element but there's a, a negatively curved space outside of the black hole, uh, and this is what the classical geometry looks like. Are there any questions about this? At this point, I've done things classically. I'll be doing this thing quantum mechanically in a second. Yes? I just want to ask whether, what is that sigma three, the poly matrix? Uh, sigma three is the, the third poly matrix. Um, so, okay, uh, are there other questions? So it's, this is a diagonal matrix. Uh, it's, a, it's a third poly, since it's SL2R, okay? Any other questions? Okay, so um, anyway, so this is um, uh, the bulk. Now, let me, let me still um, stay in the bulk for a second. Suppose I would want to do this thing quantum mechanically. So I live in the bulk. Uh, I've, I've managed to extract the rules, the classical rules of, of, of relativity, uh, and I have a classical theory that has these properties. But I also know my world is quantum mechanical, uh, and now I want to go and do quantum uh, gravity in this, in this theory. How would I do it? Okay. Um, so, um, in a quantum theory, uh, what you would uh, do is you would say, okay, well, suppose I have a bunch of these point particles. Uh, and maybe, who knows, there could be one black hole somewhere. Um, and um, I want to be able to, say, write down the quantum state of these point particles. So what I do is I have to write down the positions of these particles, and I have to write down an n-particle wave function uh, which, um, at a given moment in time, uh, would be uh, a wave function that would depend on uh, n positions. Uh, z here will denote for me two spatial directions. So z is z and z bar. So that's a two-dimensional plane where those uh, particles are sitting. Uh, and of course, I would need uh, a time direction as well. Uh, and that's my n particle uh, wave function. Uh, and um, in order to write down this n-particle wave function, I actually have to work pretty hard. Actually, um, yeah, I could do it this way, or actually I could give each of these particles their own time coordinate um, by having them propagate uh, with a wave equation. 
But let me not talk about time yet too much. Uh, let me s first focus on space. So if I take one particle and I take the wave function of one particle and I move it around the other particle, something non-trivial happens. Uh, because in two plus one dimensions, the plane uh, is, uh, makes it uh, possible, for, again, for particles to go around each other. Uh, and there's something non-trivial precisely happening when these particles go around each other. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, these z-coordinates, uh, one way you can think about SL2R times SL2R is that uh, in terms of the two-dimensional coordinates, something like this happens, where, again, SL2R, uh, an SL2R matrix is a matrix that looks like this. Uh, where A times D minus B times C is equal to 1. And for that as a to R matrix, uh, I can have these kind of transition functions. And um, so something non-trivial seems to happen when these particles move around each other. So I'm sitting on this curved space where there are curvature singularities at the positions of the particles. Nonetheless, this wave function has to be single-valued. Uh, so, what I'm t uh, summarizing here is that uh, these particles have a version of what you would call rate statistics, that something non-trivial is happening when the particles go around each other because of the geometry. At the same time, uh, there's single-valuedness of the wave function. Uh, and it turns out, actually, that if you would want to solve these constraints, that's a very hard problem to do. It's a very hard quantum problem to do. Uh, so doing quantum gravity in this world is actually hard, uh, which is not surprising. Quantum gravity is a hard, uh, a hard subject, even in two plus one dimensions. However, um, Sorry, why is it single value? What, what does the single value? Why is it single value? I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, to be honest, I've been going back and forth on this thing many times. Uh, but the basic question is that, uh, the, the basic answer is the following, is that when it lives on this space, it lives on that space, meaning the wave function really should be living on that space. Uh, so indeed, there's a, a non-trivial go uh, relation going on when, when, they, when they are uh, going around each other. Nonetheless, the wave function should be single-valued. And let me already give, give away a punchline, which will happen in a second is that solving this problem is equivalent to solving the conformal bootstrap of BPC. So the quantum version of this problem is section three of the paper that you should have read. Okay? So, um, uh, and, uh, and if you would be able to solve it, if you would find the spectrum of particles uh, and, and, and you solve these equations, you've actually constructed a two-dimensional CFT. And that's or another way of saying it, if you have a CFT, you have a solution to this problem. So, um, so now let me uh, give you my proposal more specifically for what CD CFT ADS really is. So, um, again, normally we say, we're saying, okay, well, we only know about the boundary, but I'm going to give you a precise prescription of what the bulk is. So, let me again draw that picture. Uh, if I want to write down, uh, say, a state that was produced by acting with some operator O here and another operator O there, so I have two operators, I acted with them on the boundary, and I ask, what's the state at that point, okay? Uh, well, uh, th th there's a good answer, uh, presuming uh, I started with the vacuum state, so at some early time, that was the vacuum state of the CFT. Uh, and then the state here uh, is O1 at some earlier location, O2 acting uh, at some earlier time, uh, acting on the vacuum. Uh, and um, I'll put a little L here uh, saying that this is done uh, in Lorentzian signature. So let me call this thing O1, O2. L, uh, where I uh, do the time evolution in Lorentzian signature like that. Uh, so this uh, is an analog of the operator state correspondence. Uh, I'm a bit schematic in my notation here. Again, these operators are acting at particular locations, say x, t on the boundary, x1, t1, 
x2, t2 on the boundary, okay? So uh, this gives me the CFT Hilbert space uh, from the boundary perspective of the CFT. Are there any questions about this description of the Hilbert space? Now, that state lives on this circle uh, at a given moment in time. Uh, I could take the same CFT, I could put it, uh, uh, Rick rotate it to Euclidean space, and I can take that CFT and put it on that circle. And I can take an other uh, state that I'm going to be creating uh, by acting with an operator, say, O3 here and an operator O4 there. So O3 and O4 are now operators that are acting at some spatial location in the block at the time slice C, uh, T. Uh, and so this here is well defined in the CFT. I have another state that I can define which lives on that slice here. Uh, I do that in Euclidean space, uh, and I have an O3, O4 Euclidean, which I can define by having two Euclidean locations and acting on the same vacuum state. So maybe, yeah, this is the same vacuum state. Question? Yeah. So when you say uh, yeah. this is a box slice, that's right. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll explain. I'll explain how this works. Uh, um, so, uh, the look, uh, indeed, I have to be more careful what I mean by locations in the bulk. But um, um, uh, for now, I'll just uh, uh, do it this way, uh, and, and we, we can talk about this 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 um, uh, uh, this way. So. Um, for now, what I'll do is I, I now have just uh, two mappings. Uh, two ways of making uh, a CFT Hilbert space, uh, a Lorentzian way and a Euclidean way. Um, and uh, what, this is my way in which I'm going to uh, talk about states that actually have excitations in the bulk. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll look at the structure of those states in a second. Uh, I can indeed take the overlap of this state with that state, so these things uh, are uh, living in the same Hilbert space but I claim that this way of representing the state is something that will give me information about the CFT uh, in, in the book. Uh, I can look at this thing from the top. Let's do that. So, that's, uh, that circle is the boundary of ADS. Uh, this plane here now is the constant time slice. Uh, and one thing I could do, for example, I could act with a bunch of operators here, or I could put, uh, and uh, what I would like to do here is to act with many operators uh, that combined have some large conformal dimension. Uh, because if I do that, I'm creating a very large conformal dimension state in the CFT, uh, and my goal is indeed to create a black hole here. Okay? So I consider a CFT state that I hope will have a black hole there. Uh, but uh, the state is obtained by doing the CFT path integral over this, uh, over this disk. So the boundary, say, could be zz bar equals one. So I have the zz bar plane. This, ho this, this blackboard is the zz bar plane, and the boundary is the location zz bar equals one. The interior of the boundary is what you could call the Poincaré disk, uh, and it is... Uh, is um, uh, a spatial section of ADS space. I put a bunch of operators there, so I do this prescription with, with say, uh, an operator which combined I'll call OM. Uh, and I'm interested in probing that geometry, uh, probing that state by acting with some other operator that acts at some other point, which I call OM. Uh, and uh, I want to study uh, this, this state. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, 
Yeah, so if people, uh, okay, if, if you want to say, okay, well, what, okay, let me be a bit more specific about what this thing represents, okay? So, um, suppose um, I would not look at a state, but I would have looked at a um, boundary boundary correlation function. Then, um, um, I could have, okay, let, let me say it more, more clearly. If I ask, I do this thing for, um, say, one operator. So, uh, so I only have, say, O3 and I have O1, okay? Suppose I would do that. Then um, the overlap of the state O3 with O1 Uh, is obtained uh, by taking the CFT on this uh, external geometry. So I take the, out the uh, CFT, the, the Lorentzian CFT on the cylinder, and I take the overlap with the Euclidean CFT state created by the Euclidean section. Uh, and I claim that that two point function, O3, O1, this is a two point function, O3, O1, uh, and it is the bulk boundary propagator. It's the thing that propagates me from here into the bulk. So the prescription that you would want to give, namely uh, to say, hey, a bulk operator can be expressed in terms of boundary operators, that prescription is here as well, that the Euclidean state that I've defined by the Euclidean uh, CFT has an overlap with the Lorentzian state like that, uh, and it's given by the bulk, the overlap is given by the bulk boundary propagator. So, Right, the two st Hilbert spaces are not independent. They are the same Hilbert space. And that's why I'm able to uh, represent the internal Hilbert space in terms of the uh, bulk, oh, sorry, in terms of the boundary Hilbert space. So the two things are, 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 are glued together. But I'm saying that doing the Euclidean section like that is, uh, is, is more helpful uh, because then I'm, allowed, then I'm able to start talking about the properties of the state at a given time slice. So it's a more useful basis of the Hilbert space. Uh, by the way, so this dictionary uh, that the spatial section uh, of two plus one gravity um, can be represented as a object like this uh, is not new. Uh, it's actually um, older than ADS CFT. Uh, this prescription that there's a relationship between uh, uh, CFTs and two plus one dimensional uh, 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 diffeomorphism invariant theories uh, was known um, in, uh, in the days of the connection between Chun Simons theories and Wesley Mini Witten models. Uh, and actually, uh, I wrote a paper in 1989 where I showed that you can do the same thing with uh, theories of the Virazoro algebra. So with the Wetter Minimitten models, you have a current algebra which can be connected to gauge theories in the bulk. Uh, and indeed, you can show that this dictionary uh, can be made rather explicit uh, with, and I'll give you four pieces of evidence for it, okay? Let me, uh, let me speed up, because otherwise I'm going to lose too much time. Okay, um, so let me give you the, the four pieces of evidence. Uh, the very first piece of evidence, I'll be very quick with this. Um, so if you have an operator uh, and it has certain conformal dimension, a left and a right conformal dimension, then uh, if you apply this SL2Z transformation, say, to the left movers, and uh, then it transforms in a prescribed way like that, where this is the left moving conformal dimension. Um, and, um, and I have a similar formula for the right movers. Uh, and the claim is that if you have objects uh, like that, an object function of z and z bar, um, that transforms like this, 
uh, and I would do the following. I would define some other function, say some psi of g uh, with some quantum numbers m comma s, uh, which are related to this delta left and delta right by the formula that I had before, um, where this thing is given by uh, integrating over a contour where this, so let me call this thing g acting on z and a similar formula for c bar. So if I relate z and z bar by a map g and I integrate o over that, over a contour where I have fixed that relation, I get a function of this g uh, and uh, this function solves the wave equation on ADS3. Uh, with uh, the quantum numbers that you need here. It's a particle of a given mass. So this is similar to what you would do in the boundary, where indeed you can show that uh, a boundary field with a given uh, conformal dimension actually solves the wave equation. In this case, uh, I'm doing this in the Euclidean way. Um, uh, starting with the Euclidean section, uh, and I propagate forward in time. Uh, there's another result that you can do, uh, that you can uh, show. Suppose I would consider a wave function uh, of a metric. So I'm going to take a two-dimensional metric, which I write as follows. Uh, maybe it's the other way around. This is a two-dimensional metric. Uh, and I could do the same thing uh, maybe by changing dz bar. This is a component of the two-dimensional metric, and you can always find coordinate systems where the two-dimensional metric would look like that. Then I can look at the wave function as a function of that metric. Uh, and one way of writing that wave function is to take the two-dimensional stress energy tensor. Uh, and for example, I could put also a bunch of operators here or not, if I want to. Uh, and I can look at this object in the CFT. Um, one can show that this thing considered as a wave function of the two-dimensional metric so it's a, it's a functional of the two-dimensional metric and therefore it's a wave functional of a two plus one dimensional theory whose configuration space is the space of two-dimensional metrics and you can show that this thing solves the Wheeler DeWitt equation Uh, and that thing um, uh, follows from uh, another famous equation of uh, BPZ, which I'll write down on the next blackboard. Let me go up here. Let me go here. So there's this equation that if you take a stress energy tensor and you have a bunch of operators, that there is some differential operator that acts on this thing where t hat of z is the sum over i, delta i, these are the conformal dimensions of the other operators, o i, z minus z i squared, with derivative z minus z i. Okay, so this is this uh, conformal word identity, uh, and from this equation, you can show that this thing actually solves uh, the really the width equation of two-dimensional two gravity, two plus one-dimensional gravity. Question. Yes. Uh, not if you insist on being uh, in this gauge, but um, uh, given that T uh, satisfies uh, that equation, uh, you can show that the um, gauge invariant configuration space of this thing is a space that's called Teichmüller space. It sort of was described roughly in, 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 in uh, similar to this moduli space that Hirose described. In this case, the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. H is called the Beltrami differential. It's the deformation of constant curvature metrics in two plus one dimensions. Uh, and indeed, uh, you can show that the uh, configuration space or the phase space actually of two plus one dimensional gravity is two copies of Teichmüller space. It's the space of constant curvature metrics on Riemann surfaces or the space of constant curvature metrics on surfaces with punctures. You take two copies of it 
and it's the phase space of two plus one dimensional gravity. Uh, and there's a whole series of beautiful papers by the Samalochikovs, by Teschner, that show that if you quantize Teichmuller space, you obtain the space of conformal blocks in two plus one dimensions. So the, it's, indeed it's indeed known now that quantizing two plus one dimensional gravity gives you correlation functions of a CFT. Now there's an additional structure that I should have uh, emphasized, uh, which is also part of uh, BPZ, which is that if you take, say, a four-point function uh, and you take two operators uh, at the location zero, another operator at the location one, another one at the location zz bar, and the other one you take it at infinity, you can use the SO2z term symmetry to do that. Uh, then as a function of z and z bar, this is a, a four-point function, uh, and uh, it factorizes over if I uh, uh, would project on some intermediate channel uh, as follows, where you take the operator product of one with two, that gives you a state alpha, you take the operator product of three and four, that gives you also, should give you the same state alpha. And then this thing gets multiplied times an object which I call psi alpha of z. But for given alpha, the object holomorphically factorizes, meaning it, it, it is a product of z, a function of z times a function of z bar. So this is a famous equation of um, so the Samologikovs. This thing here uh, is a conformal block. Uh, and you can think about it as uh, a partial wave. Uh, and again, uh, the work by Teschner et al. Um, has shown that if you quantize uh, the space of constant curvature metrics on a real surface, you actually uh, obtain wave functions that have exactly uh, the same properties as these conformal blocks. Again, these things are called OPE coefficients. Okay, uh, I see I need to hurry up a little bit. So uh, let me be uh, a bit uh, quick here. Um, so the crucial uh, ingredient uh, of um, the conformal bootstrap that Poyakov, uh, Samolochkov, and uh, Bajvan uh, set up uh, is that if you have a um, uh, an correlation function, a four-point function like that, that four-point function should have crossing symmetry, which is precisely the single validness of the correlation functions. And that crossing symmetry gives you a very non-trivial relation among these uh, OPE coefficients. Uh, and the key uh, property that allows you to do computations is that if you would take one of these conformal blocks, uh, which I can uh, draw like this, So the operator one and two, uh, or say four and three, uh, fuse into an operator alpha, and have the operator three and four that also fuse into it. This is the standard notation. This thing uh, is related via a matrix, which is known as the fusion matrix, to uh, something that looks like that. So where you factorize in another channel. Uh, these matrices you can compute, and indeed uh, what also people like Teschner have shown is that if you take general um, uh, conformal blocks, these matrices can precisely be uh, computed as overlaps between wave functions obtained by quantizing um, uh, the space of metrics in two plus one, uh, yeah, of uh, constant curvature metrics. Okay, in the last 10 minutes, six minutes, um, I'm going to um, explain, uh, an, uh, that's a third piece of evidence, um, how uh, to, uh, a, this particular situation that I've indicated here, uh, where is it? Um, got to indicate it. Where did it go? Uh, went away. Did I erase it? I probably didn't erase it. 
uh, it was behind here, okay? Uh, in a situation where I have a heavy operator, a thing with a co high conformal dimension operator, um, uh, that uh, there's actually a metric you can associate uh, to uh, uh, a, um, uh, a conformal block, and that metric is the spatial section of uh, an ADS uh, three geometry. Um, so basically, I'm going to t show that this particular geometry is precisely encoded in the structure of, uh, of the CFT. Uh, this is technology, again, that was developed uh, a long time ago, uh, actually by people like um, Gervais and Neveu, uh, who were studying Liouville theory, and then re-developed uh, later uh, in papers by um, uh, um, Nati Seiberg. Uh, so let me go um, be quick here. So uh, the idea is the following. Uh, if you give yourself uh, an um, stress energy tensor, like this thing, then uh, from a given stress energy tensor you can uh, extract uh, a uh, geometry, uh, a constant curvature geometry on the Riemann surface. Uh, and the idea is the following, is that there there is a special field you could consider in the CFT, which is known as a degenerate field, that satisfies the following equation. This degenerate field is phi 1, 2, like that. So if I would know T as a function of Z, uh, I could solve this equation. Uh, and it's actually an operator, and you can insert it in a correlation function, and dt is also an operator. But let me now go to the semi-classical limit and solve this equation. Uh, another thing I should notice is the following, is that this um, operator t um, has indeed a behavior which you can extract from this piece here. Uh, and in particular, if there's uh, an operator here that creates a very high conformal dimension state, then you have this particular term here. So indeed, what I'm going to assume in the discussion here is that this T of Z behaves like that, where this delta is some very high conformal dimension operator, okay? If you do that, uh, you can solve this equation. Uh, and the solution, to, uh, there are actually two solutions. So if T of Z goes like delta over Z squared, and I'm going to assume that delta is much, much bigger than C over 12, and also be in the limit where this is much, much bigger than one, which is basically the ADS CFT limit. Uh, then the two solutions, uh, which I'll denote by uh, psi plus minus of Z, uh, it goes like e to the power plus or minus i times alpha over 2, uh, where alpha um, squared is 24 central charge, sorry, 24 times delta over the central charge. Uh, this b, sorry, I should have mentioned that, uh, in this limit, b uh, is square root of 6 over C. Okay, so um, uh, this thing here is a special state. You find it in the uh, BPZ paper. Uh, it's called the degenerate uh, state of type 1, 2. Um, and uh, the significance of that state is the following. It has a certain uh, conformal dimension. And again, in this particular limit, the conformal dimension of delta 1, 2 is minus a half. So it's a minus a half differential. It's a little bit of a strange operator. But uh, the significance of it is that the, um, it's essentially an exponential of the Liouville field. Uh, and you can uh, extract a geometry from it. Uh, 
uh, essentially by doing this. So you have to, t uh, since this is a minus a half differential, if I divide by it, if I take one over the square of it, it's a one differential, a one comma one form. Uh, so this actually is uh, both left and right movers. Uh, and this is a two-dimensional metric. Uh, it's often written as e to the Liouville times dz, dz bar. Uh, one problem, little problem you have to solve carefully uh, is that um, since there are two solutions, um, you have to uh, actually uh, combine the two in a uh, neat single-valued combination. And it turns out that the single-valued combination that you have to take of those two solutions, psi plus, psi minus, is psi plus times of z times psi minus z bar minus psi minus of z times psi plus of z bar. And if you take those two solutions, uh, this combination, you plug it in here, you're going to find a metric, which I'll write down uh, for you. It's alpha squared dz dz bar divided by zz bar sine squared alpha over 2 logarithm zz bar. It looks complicated, but it's obtained exactly by plugging in these two solutions into here, plugging it in here. Uh, that's it. Okay, so what does that geometry look like? Uh, this, uh, again, appears in a paper also uh, by Sarvik uh, in 19 -1. Um, and he indeed points out that if you have uh, an operator with a large conformal dimension, that the corresponding constant curvature metric that you would uh, be, uh, want to associate to it in Liouville theory uh, has this particular form. Uh, and uh, if you would draw this particular metric, if you make a drawing of it, it would look exactly like that. So in the last uh, one minute, let me try to uh, summarize what this means. I'll just give you a physical picture of what the meaning of this is. Uh, let's see, should I keep that here or move it up? Let's move it up. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I got a pure state for BTZ. Even the, the geometry looks like that. Uh, uh, and let me, let, me, let me try to summarize more in more detail what, what, what the final picture is here, okay? So uh, in Sarvik's paper, he, he indeed emphasizes the following, that uh, if you have an operator with a large conformal dimension and you would like to write down the corresponding metric, the corresponding metric looks a little bit odd. Uh, namely, it doesn't seem to be associated with the puncture. Uh, and in, in, in Sarvik's terminology, he called actually these states normalizable, but they were not local. Uh, and these states were actually local, but it turned out that they were not normalizable, okay? Uh, so the picture uh, uh, that arises here is um, that I could consider uh, precisely the situation that I erased earlier on the blackboard, where uh, I, I can take a state in the CFT and I create it by a bunch of operators. So here's my disk, and I consider the Euclidean CFT on this disk. I take a bunch of local operators, many of them that all look like that. But now I look in the channel that was created, and that channel that was created had a huge conformal dimension. So delta is big here, okay? I look at the stress energy tensor in that neighborhood. I extract a constant curvature metric from the stress energy tensor. It's the uniformization metric. This is the prescription. And that metric will have this throat geometry. Uh, if I draw the metric that I have on this disk, I would draw it like this. There's this throat geometry. There's a boundary that sits at zz bar equals one, 
which is where this metric blows up. Then there's a horizon. But then there's a region where there are all these operators here. Uh, and this, this geometry is called the plumbing fixture. Uh, and you could take a sphere where I have many operators, local operators, and they all have these cusps sitting here. So this is a negative curvature space, which has a throw geometry, but it's still part of a CFT Hilbert space. So it's a single-sided CFT, but the geometry looks like this, and it has this horizon sitting here. In the last minus one minute, <laughs> uh, let me give you an interpretation of, of, uh, of this location here, okay? So the interpretation is the following, is that uh, the state that I'm looking here uh, at here is uh, OM of Z acting on some state with some big mass M. So this is OM, and suppose that I have some other O of little m, uh, and it sits at some location Z, okay? Uh, and I can ask if I now decompose this into this is, again, a, a famous equation in BPZ. You take the operator product coefficient, uh, operator product expansion of an uh, operator with another operator, and uh, that operator expansion, indeed, has operator product coefficients, and it has um, uh, a z-dependence, which you can look up in their paper. Uh, and what you can show uh, is that for a given function of z, f f given the value of z, Z, I can ask in this operator product expansion, what is the optimal value, what is the maximal contribution for omega in this operator product coefficient uh, expansion? Now, if Z is very close to this thing, then there's some high powers of Z in the denominator. Look in BPC, you should have done your homework. One over Z to some high power, uh, and, it, and it favors uh, if Z is very close to these things, it favors negative values of omega. Whereas if, uh, if you take um, um, Z to be far away over here, it favors positive values of omega. So in this OPE expansion, this, op this, 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 this thing which creates a particle can either add energy or it can subtract energy. Uh, and when it subtracts energy, it basically disappears into the black hole because when it subtracts energy, it lowers the entropy of the state. And if you go from a higher entropy state to a lower entropy state, you will not be able to reconstruct what this thing actually was. But you can indeed show that precisely the value where omega is equal to zero in this expansion, the saddle point value for omega equal to zero, is precisely sitting at that location where this metric uh, switches, th uh, goes through the, uh, the neck. Okay, let me uh, conclude um, uh, just uh, with some homework exercises. Um, the homework exercises are, um, uh, second quantize this. Uh, just means you look at many particles. Uh, you have to think about it. It's, a, it's an open problem. Um, second homework exercise. Uh, find the wrong implicit assumption in the AMPS paper. Should be able to do it. Um, third homework exercise, that's really the hard one. Uh, generalize this to higher dimensions. Okay, thank you.